I'll take it. Good, it's on. Thank you, everybody, for coming again today, for joining us today to just continue the discussion here. I know we talked about student engagement and safety and, and all that of all of our students. Um, if there's any updates on anything that anyone cares to share on anything that's happened since Monday, that's great. Otherwise, we can just talk about some of the issues with budget and things like that, the concerns that people have expressed. It'd be better to turn off our microphones and videos unless we're talking, just to help with the bandwidth. Hello, Jeff. Hello. Um, there is one item that came up since the last meeting, okay. and that's uh, furloughs. Could we add that to the agenda? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we had just, yeah, we could even start with that because I think we had um, kind of started a discussion on that a few minutes ago. Um, so, sure, absolutely. Do we want to just start off talking about furloughs? Okay. Sounds good to me. Well, since I raised it, I guess I, I can say a few words. I mean, uh, back when Doyle had the furloughs, I know um, we were included in them, even though it doesn't seem like it makes much sense because, you know, the university is not going to save any money. The state's not going to save any money if we furlough our staff. When I tried to appeal last time, my institution said, well, the idea is to treat everybody the same. And uh, so they wanted it to be uniform across the board. But I did it request again of my supervisor at least that we be exempted from it but I haven't heard anything back so I think my chances are slim. Has anyone else tried to uh, reach out and see if they can not have I can speak for University of Wisconsin Scout um, was told like um, so right now they're looking at some different calculations for different amounts of intermittent furlough that does not include grant um, funded positions in it, but that is only because they do not know if legally they can. System Legal is looking into it for the entire UW system grant funded positions. Um, they are still collecting feedback, so I'm going to be submitting um, feedback for myself, my associate dean, and our McNair director to our Senate representative. Um, I also have a call this afternoon with COE to gather kind of, you know, some language from them and what to put in that feedback. Um, some of our concerns are, like, for SSS, we're ending at the end of August. We already have carryover that we'll be giving back. Um, this could negatively impact our future awards. We could end up being awarded less money if we're giving back more money at this point. Um, inherently, we're not equitable when you're grant-funded. As you know, there's inherent risk of, of not having a job every five years, so I feel like this is supposed to be one of the benefits. For us is that we have a different funding spring, um, string and we avoid furloughs. Um, I, I get, you know, the argument for optics and, and being equitable, but the university loses money when they don't spend down our grants. They get less indirects. So, um, but I was, yeah, I was told that same line in 2009 that there was precedent. So I, I'm just trying to see if we can reset precedent. This is Nancy. Um, what we were told was when we all were furloughed in 2009, it was all state employees. That is not the case right now. That it's really the university, and each university is handling it differently. I have not gotten official notification, but my grants director told me that grants people will be um, held um, harmless, that we will not be furloughed, but I haven't gotten that in writing yet. I was initially told that as well, Nancy, from our, our grants accountant, that we weren't being considered in the projections, but I've learned that we weren't being considered in the projections because they're waiting on system legal to tell them if we can be. That makes sense, and that also makes sense why we haven't gotten anything in writing yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, you're still mute. You're still muted. You're muted. Here, Karen. I shouldn't be muted now. Oh, now you're good. Oh, 
Oh, okay. I, it's, it's showing me that I'm muted. So, all right. Uh, what I was saying is, if you think about the whole reason, it's because of the fiscal exigency for all of our institutions. And in our case, the funding that we have, uh, it's there anyway. And it, it's not university funding unless you have some split positions that are being paid partially by the university. But if you're 100% grant, then that the, the, that's not going to, to affect what's going on. And that point about the indirect, that's a very good point too as well. So um, my understanding here at Milwaukee is that uh, if you have a grant, you're, you're totally on the grant, that funding will hold and that we will not um, be subject to the furlough. That's my understanding. So I, I'm probably a little ignorant on this with the systems, but is it does each school have the ability to determine how they want to furlough or not furlough, or is that mm -hmm. really going to be system wide? Um, well, I mean, system legal will tell tell each campus what they can do if campuses choose not to do it. They don't have to. Um, each campus can choose how they want to intermittently furlough their staff. I think every campus has to do furloughs, but how they do it is still up to each campus. Every campus has a different budget reality that they're living in right now, as you know, for debt obligations and um, the amount that they're trying to make up. So, sure, okay. So I think that's one of the reasons why the each campus has some fl flexibility within the policy to do what they feel is best for their campus. That's correct, and the last time we were furloughed, there was no flexibility. Every state employee was held accountable to the same rules and regulations. Uh, well, if anyone does get that exemption and you're, you're able to um, not have to have the furlough apply to you, please let us know so that we can use that in our, with the. Well, the, I think what we were thinking of Bruce was if we could, um, you know, if we could request that the way out board, maybe write a letter to system, including, you know, some of our concerns and then any information I get from my meeting with COE today to kind of advocate as a strong unit. And then if that doesn't work, then yeah, of course, take the, you know, continue to advocate on your individual campuses. But, you know, I'd like to see us all not get furloughed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, Angie, to work together on that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Are you, are you including the upper bound programs in that too? Because they're still obligated to provide their summer session and furloughs could be a nightmare for those. No, I know McNair had the round table um, and Sarah when let me know that they're in support of asking way out to write a letter. I, I don't know about upward bound. We don't have that on our campus, so. I believe that Sarah, also, she said she added it to our board meeting agenda and our board meeting is next Wednesday. Um, right. Who knows how fast that is due to our faculty senate person today. Yeah. Academic senate person today, yeah. I just wanted to let you know it's on the agenda to discuss and um, you may not know anything from system legal until then. I know I have a meeting with my supervisor this afternoon um, and he's going to give us further updates for River Falls. So I have no idea what he's going to say. Okay, so it sounds like that might be an ongoing part of our discussion then, based on what people find out. Yeah. Yeah, this is Vicki Bruce, brand new vice chancellor, and our information changes daily or hourly. And 
He doesn't have a lot of meetings. He can't focus on last minute. So it's been really frustrating. And I'm, of course, my office is half and half, half disability, half grant. So it's it would be great for us to have some kind of support overall from the state organization. So thanks a lot. This is Melissa, and I'm um, at a private institution at Marion, and I'm knocking on wood that we don't end up needing to do furloughs. Right now, the word on the street is that because we're a smaller institution, we were eligible for some additional um, funding through some of the, um, I don't want to say small business grants, but some of the, the CARES Act things that the UW system isn't eligible for. So knock on wood, we won't have to be furloughed. But to the point of um, way up writing a letter in the support, I'd definitely, yes, be interested in helping with that. If all of you are writing up, um, you know, some talking points to, to share with your supervisors, or um, I would ask that maybe somebody wants to be the point person to um, gather some of those uh, talking points or comments so that we could use all of that in a letter of support together. And Angie, I think you said you were talking with COE this afternoon. If you have any notes from that, um, that would be great too. Does anybody, can have those as well. Does anybody want to be the um, point person? Uh, people could send it to me. That's fine. I can gather it all together. There. I put my, uh, email address up there for you all. Okay. Well, maybe we can move on to the first point we have in, in the uh, budgetary column here. Um, that was how to, res how to properly spend down grant money given changing EW system policies and procedures. That was the first point. Anybody have anything to say about how, what they're doing in terms of that issue? At UW Milwaukee, we have a summer bridge program. So we're going to spend a nice chunk of that anyway this summer because we're moving the bridge program online. This is Vicki from Eau Claire. I was going to hire one of our graduate assistants who's finishing his degree and he wanted to still work for us in summer to try to help us get some of our files and paperwork organized to finish up this fifth year. And I put in the request to fail quite a while ago and it's everything sitting on hold because of the campus um, instructions to not fill any requests for positions. So even though I put in there that it would be grant money and that we had the money in the budget, it's still just sitting and, and likely not to be filled. So it's kind of hard to move things forward, you know, to spend your money and to have a plan if they're not going to approve it and move it on. Yeah, well, uh, that's interesting because we're looking at kind of the same thing, using some of our money for our master's degree and now we're looking at bringing him back too but this little less than a lukewarm re I reception of that idea from our senior leadership not for uh, people there in we have we're tiptoeing around that and seeing if we can uh, get some bottom from that but that's one of the things we're looking at doing as well.
Um, hey guys, this is Natalie from Marquette. Um, one of the things that we have been able to do is hire student workers to help us connect with other students in the program virtually. So we kind of feel like for our summer bridge program, um, we're non-residential this year, of course, or this summer. And that means that we have a lot of funds that we need to spend down because we don't have the cost of the students living in the dorms. Um, but to help engage students virtually, we're hiring additional um, peer counselors um, as well as students to do some um, create videos, um, help with doing virtual interviews just so that they're um, we're getting a little bit more assistance in doing this, trying to create a community virtually, which we thought more hands on deck would be helpful. UW Milwaukee, we're, we're doing the same in terms of having uh, additional student helpers to so that we can reach out to our students and, and kind of keep track of what they're doing, what they're feeling um, as we're moving through the summer and into the fall. We're doing the same thing with student help. Uh, our college has agreed to pay. Utilize them to help with like, to help us help the advisors and coaches with with that. Hi, um, this is Maria Starcasey. I'm with Beloit College. Um, I was wondering if with the um, OMB memorandum that came out, um, if students did not have, um, say, a laptop or something, do you think that? With that expansion of the rules, we would be able to provide that for students where before it would have been something that possibly had to be used on a limited basis. Anyone have any opinions on that? I'm not actually sure about that myself. <laughs> so if anyone else has any. It read in the memorandum that um, we were able to provide things without prior pr approval that would ensure that our students would not have a disruption in their educational um, experience and educational program. Um, so if they don't have a laptop and they're required to zoom into their classes, wouldn't we be able to make the argument for that? Hi, Maria. This is Stacy from Gateway. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, during the MAP webinars that they've been having through COE, they are saying to go ahead and purchase computers, um, provide Wi-Fi via hotspots, all kind of like on a um, checkout system, kind of like the library. Um, but okay. they did they did approve it, or they did say go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. intention that they would return it upon um, campus opening up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, the next thing we have is somebody had uh, written, our institution requires a match for grant aid. Although that requirement has been waived, we were told to wait for further guidance from Department of Ed. Um, they had not heard anything, at least that as of last week. Um, then the question was, do we need to request this waiver from our program officer? Does anybody have any suggestions or feedback on that? This is Stacy again. Jeff, that was to increase it? Is that the question? I was on mute again. Um, we were told to wait for further. Um, Can I jump in, Jeff? Yeah, yeah please do. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure. So some institutions require a match for grant aid, um, and it depends on um, the number of low-income students, if you're Title III title eligible or not. So UW-River Falls is no longer Title III eligible. So when we have when we give out grant aid, the university has to provide a match for that. So in essence, 
instead of we, we give out $25,000 in our own grant aid, they provide an additional $8,300. So really, we get to give away $33,000. Um, but through the CARES Act now, I believe the institution has to request it to be waived. I don't think it's a flat out waive, but someone else might have a different read on that. Um, I, so I, I think they think said it to check. Oh, go ahead, Stacy. I'm pretty sure they said the match right now is out the window. Um, that it doesn't have to be. Um, and this is only from last week's webinar. Um, and then they also said that you can go ahead and raise it. Uh, without getting permission, but to put in your um, request um, no less than two weeks after you do it. Um, whether it's a, it doesn't matter if it's not approved, though, that you can go ahead and raise it. Okay, but you can only have 20%, right? You can only do a 20% grant, correct? 20% grant aid. I'm going to look at my notes because they did mention the 20%, but I think that we're able to go over now. Yeah, I think the 20% is in the regulations. This is rude that you, you know, unless they've waived that too. Um, I think the regulations pretty much allow you to increase grant aid without permission. It does say that if you transfer funds from students, you know, support costs, participant support costs, other areas, then you have to get permission. So if you're reducing your grant aid, you always need to get permission. To increase it, I don't think you need permission. You know, if you're a, an institution that's not having to match anyway, I think you can increase as you wanted to. However, you know, earlier in a grant cycle when I increased grant aid, my uh, program officer did tell me they wanted me to keep it at that level, you know, every subsequent year of that grant, um, unless I got permission to reduce it again. But I don't think that would apply to many of us since we're almost all in the last year of our grants. So I think you would be able to increase your grant aid without prior permission, as long as, you know, that you don't have any matching issues. This is Stacy again. I found the note um, for Maureen's webinar and I double starred it and it said that regulations, just like you said before, you can't spend more than 20%, but they said that if you, you can do it, you can spend, spend more than 20%, you can go over it, but you have to include it in the paragraph if you are going over 20%, the one that you send saying that you're raising it. So that's what the double star says. It just says that you can go over the 20%, but you have to include it when you let them know that you're raising it because of what we're going through during this time. I would recommend if you haven't watched that webinar yet, it's taped. Um, it was emailed out um, April 20th, the recordings were. And if you click on the MAP one for um, college um, webinars, then the whole presentation, and that's when she talks about money or grant aid. This is Laura Franklin. I don't, for some reason, I've just, maybe I'm just being overly cautious. I, I just didn't feel as comfortable with COE's take on that without the Department of Education word on that. Am I just being overly cautious? That's a good point. I, I don't know. Is that something we need to hear from the Department of Ed on? God, is the COE's word good enough? I think that, like what Bruce said, what's in the regulations is pretty clear in terms of going up to the 20%. Um, and maybe just reviewing the recording, like Stacy said, to see, you know, what that wording actually is and what you might do to request more than 20 percent if that's what you want to do. Um, so there's regulations you can follow, but yeah. This is Bruce. I, one thing you want, might want to be mindful of, though, is it will affect your indirect costs, too. So 
you know, if you're going to move $10,000 from your budget to grant aid that wasn't already in grant aid, then that's an $800 that there won't be indirect charge on. So, I mean, in a way, as long as your institution's okay with that, you'd actually have $10,800 then that you could put into grant aid instead of the $10,000. One thing I had, one other question I had about grant aid, though, is, you know, we're supposed to make sure that students first get all other forms of federal aid that they're eligible for. And so with the new CARES Act that was passed, I'm not sure when that money is going to be dispersed to students um, because we wouldn't want to use our grant aid and then find out, oh, that student would have gotten aid anyway. Um, does anyone have any ideas about that? I'm kind of a, a point person assisting my institution with the CARES Act funding. The CARES Act funding is now in our account, and so as soon as we feel ready as an institution, we will start to disperse that. So the, the money has flown through into G5s in a lot of places. Uh, this is ready to say that our institution, I'm helping with the disbursement process. We have our funds and we actually, the application went live for students yesterday. Um, our students, unless they're 100% online, really should all be eligible for it. So we actually put a little bit more into our scholarship fund, but really not that much more because they are eligible for the CARES funds. But how your institution, I guess, decides how they're going to give the award amounts, that's probably really up in the air at a lot of institutions because everyone's going to be different in how they justify award dollars. Karen at Milwaukee, uh, I did talk with our financial aid director, and it won't be until sometime next week that they think that they will have it all figured out so that they can let people know how to access those funds. But there also is a, um, a blog or article that was published by EAB that talked about the very the three main options that um, people uh, that would likely happen. Um, one being that it would be totally based on need and the student would not even have to apply for it. It would just be um, awarded uh, through financial aid. The second one was a where you have the student fill out some type of small uh, application that would uh, the student would have to indicate how these funds are going to be used to help them. And then the third was some kind of hybrid between the three. So, like I said, it, 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 everything is up in the air, but that's, the likelihood is going to be one of those three options. Any other comments on that issue? Um, the next point someone had provided was, what are the consequences if we have carryover funds? Anybody want to provide any information on that? This is Melissa. We can't have carryover funds if you're in your last year of your cycle. And so unless you're off cycle, there are no carryover funds this year. I, this is Nancy. I know okay. COE was hoping to get that waived or at least us allow us to carry some funds over. I don't know where that's at or if Department of Ed has, you know, given any guidance on that. Um, again, referencing this is Maria Epeloy College, the OMB memorandum, I thought that it said that we could have extension of services due to what's happening, that we could even extend our current 
project up to a year. Maria, from what I understand, that has typically been granted if your program is not renewed. And so to close out the grant and to provide the APR, but typically if your grant's renewed, um, you do return any unused funds. Okay, and then um, I also thought that said that we shouldn't expect an answer about our projects um, until a much delayed date because of everything that's going on. So we might not, what I'm, I'm suggesting is we might not know if we are um, granted another five years fast enough, I guess. They keep saying July. That's what. I think they keep on track still. Was, last I heard was that things were still on track. Hmm. Okay. There was a DOE, hi, I'm sorry, it's Angie. There was a DOE call, I want to say like a few weeks ago, where they talked about where they had been in the review process. There were four review groups. They would finished two, had the third one scheduled. The fourth was on track to be done remotely, and we're still aiming for July. But I do still keep that strategy in the back of my head. If we don't hear in time, can I use my carryover to extend our project until we hear? Thank you. I have a question. Um, so, and this was again in that webinar, they brought up students that are not Pell eligible, that if you ask, that you could possibly get um, approved to be able to award them. I have a student that it's, that's Pell L-E-U. So she met her 600% rate here at our two-year college, um, but she's just getting out of being homeless. So um, does anybody have any history with that, that you could give me an answer or, or guide me? Just making sure. Thanks, guys. Okay. Um, next point was ways to spend or save. Spend ways to spend or save on spending money. That was the next point. Not sure what that. What are people doing to spend down? I guess that's what it's looking like. That was what that question was. Well, this is Nancy. I'll go. Um, I'm extending um, the employment of our graduate intern right now to help us with recruiting and not so much recruiting students because we recruit during our advisement and registration process, but it's more in wooing those students because we are going to be, you know, remote um, the entire summer and hoping to keep SSS in front of them and also to come up with some creative strategies to kind of woo them to want to join the program come fall. Rivy, just as a basic, everybody probably saw the, we had some travel money um, from, from conference that obviously we didn't use, um, looking ahead as to whether or not any like institutional travel bans would not be lifted, so like if we couldn't travel and attend the conference in early fall, looking at, and I've got a lot of new staff signing up for some webinars that we think that are appropriate that are paid. I had my administrative staff person who's new do the COE prepare for a site visit last week. And so we're just looking at that if there's a webinar available, paying for it and getting something out of it at least. Thank you. Um, well, anybody else have anything you want to say on the whole budget issue? 
Jeff, there's a question. Uh, does returning excessive funds affect our 2020-2025 award? For those of you who've been in multiple competitions, you might have some feedback. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, this is Bruce, and this is just my opinion, but I don't think it would adversely affect you if you have some leftover funds at the end of the year. I've never given any money back to the government in all my career, but I know our Upward Bound program one year had some excess funds at the end of the grant cycle that they returned, and it didn't affect their future award. And I would think with these times being so difficult that they would understand that. Thanks, Bruce. Um, well, I guess we can jump into, you know, program recruitment and objectives and take a look at what what you all are doing to uh, plan for recruiting for the 2021 year. Given our new, especially given our, our new um, situation, what are people like strategizing in terms of reaching? Numbers of students that we need to reach to be able to get our numbers from a virtual standpoint. Yep, this is Karen. Um, at UW River Falls, we have a pretty well laid out recruitment plan with um, timing and activities and that sort of thing. So um, we've already requested uh, potential um, participants from our institutional research and Early next week, we'll be sending out, um, we have a few more uh, as a newsletter um, online program, and we have a recruitment newsletter that we send to our area upward bound programs and to your colleges to get um, some of their students and transfers. Um, and then the process just continues until um, we get through summer registration, and after that, we send out snail mail to um, participants who have not, or potential participants who have not yet applied. Um, so we we've already started that process. Our goal is to have our um, new participants by August first. It's always our goal. I'd like to stick to it to see what happens, and then um, make any necessary modifications as we go. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, we're uh, at Madison College. We're, I'm working right now on getting a, um, um, a fillable application that we can, so that they can um, access that that way. And we, I put an interest form as well on our, our webpage on the, on the Madison College website so people can uh, fill that out, and then it goes right into our, our uh, program email, and then I can get them the fillable application as well right now. Um, are working with recruiting uh, high school seniors right now. So just, just putting the word out, they think we'll put in a good word for us when they're out there meeting with students and things like that. Well, this is Claudia from UW-Madison. Uh, we have a, um, a strategy that um, uh, is kind of multi-pronged. So we, we work with the Office of Admissions to secure a list of students that um, they have uh, referred to our center. And they, we begin to, um, we, we, we usually wait until after the commitment date. So after May 1, uh, we um, uh, correspond with them and direct them to our online application. We use a Qualtrics uh, application. The challenge with Qualtrics though is that um, they can't save and then continue later. 
So our message, um, when they go to the, our site, um, it has really detailed instructions that, uh, that well, it gives them a list of things that they'll need to have available or have uh, ready or completed in order to completely fill out the application uh, so that they don't get started and then can't finish. Uh, um, again, we and it's a pretty robust list, so we really um, engage with that group. Um, they also provide us with a list of students who indicated that they were first generation um, students, but they may not have referred them uh, to our center. So then we also began to uh, communicate with uh, that group again once they've uh, committed to the university. And then we also connect with um, partners uh, that um, we're working with. We're actually um, developing a relationship with a pre-college program in Milwaukee, all in Milwaukee, um, to cultivate that relationship for referrals and to have um, uh, kind of an agreement on how we'll work with their uh, prospective uh, UW-Madison students. Our goal also is to have uh, um, have our, our students all selected by August 1. I think we actually put a deadline or a deadline of July 1. Um, so in the past year, we did kind of hit that before August 1, so we're hoping to do that. Uh, again, we anticipate we'll have to have a little more outreach students are concerned and not quite understanding you know, what's going to happen in the fall. And then um, and we have questions that we want to, we're trying to prepare to be accessible or think about how we can reach out to students and their uh, families um, as well. And then we do have a number of students that um, applied to us um, last year after the priority date. So we're also reaching out to those um, uh, first year students who are rising second year students um, to um, invite them to apply. And that's a very small number. Students. So we use social media, email. Um, we have a student that is actually working with us on that communication plan, um, and it's been really helpful to have that uh, student perspective embedded in our process. Thanks, Claudia. Anyone else want to chime in on this? All right, the next point we had was the possibility of uh, Department of Ed changes to objective requirements. And we have three thoughts listed. Thought one was remember that years two to four count towards PE prior experience. Thought two, DOE could relax objectives. And thought three, directors could request the change in objectives via program officer. Any thoughts on that? You, we don't get prior experience points for the last year in our grant because our APR will go in after we find out about the new grant. Prior experience points are only calculated on years two, three, and four. This is Rudy. I wasn't, for Nancy's reasons, I wasn't really worrying about it either because it is lucky for us this year isn't going to count and either would next year. Uh, Maureen did say in one of the calls that the Department of Ed is going to have to do something. Um, my concern thinking further down the road is dependent on how many of the students that are in cohort years now that are going to be counted actually proceed to their graduation in four years. It might have an impact from this even though it's not going to be next year because we have a hard time getting students to finish in four years anyway because they, we have a lot of part-time students. I'm seeing right now a lot of our students dropping courses or it's pretty evident they're not going to pass their courses or they're not able to get into like fall if distancing things continue, they're not going to be able to finish some lab classes until fall that ongoing it might be an issue that hits up, like why one of the cohorts had a smaller graduation rate. So I guess 
I'm going to kind of watch it, and if there is a chance to look at objectives, I might be doing it. Yeah, I'm having the exact same issue you're having Vivi, with our students as well. I mean, a lot of our first projected graduates are not going to be graduating for the very reasons you just listed. So that's something that we're definitely concerned about, it, as well as just the whole persistence thing, too. I think we're losing students we wouldn't have lost normally, I think, now, obviously. And uh, so that's going to be interesting to see how that proceeds in, a, in terms of graduation numbers. I agree with what you just said, Ruby. No, and I mean, just little things like a Photoshop class for graphic and web. A student called me and said, my instructor said, if I could take this class in the fall, I should just drop it now because it's not going to be as quality in the online format. You know, so what am I supposed to say? Oh, no, 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 there goes my objectives. You know, don't do that. <laughs> I mean, those are, those are the issues that I think. Like right now for next year, I, my first thought was I'm not going to worry about this objective stuff. But if more clarification comes, I think I need to take a really close look at my graduating cohorts that will be graduating in PE point years and see what really is going on with them before I would just say, no, my objectives are fine. Thank you. Um, this is Claudia again. I'm just wondering. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really literally thinking out loud here, so please bear with me. Um, but I know when we were going through, we were having intensive meetings about uh, policy related to um, maybe moving toward a, a pass-fail option. Um, we had conversations around, um, there were conversations around designating it for posterity's sake you know, that it was during a disrupted period. So the, the, the grade will actually include like pets disruption or, or fail disruption. Um, and I'm wondering, I don't know how it would apply to us, but I'm just wondering if there's some way that we could advocate for in our reports that this was a year of disruption due to COVID. Because I think all of our data is going to be different from any other year, or maybe two years. Um, and just for a matter of record, thinking about how that or having that be documented um, be important. So I'm just throwing that out. I'm not. I'm not quite sure how that would play out, or if it is necessary, but something to consider. That's a great point, Claudia. Anyone have any? This, this is that. a follow up because I'm just even thinking for our recruitment. I mean, everything that we're doing is going to be impacted by this disruption. Students who may have come to our institutions may make different decisions. There might be more students that even think about not going right away or waiting a semester. Um, just because we don't know what's happening with the virus, with COVID. And so even, I'm just even wondering, you know, just, you know, just even for our internal records, as we evaluate our processes and just say, you know, this was uh, a year ago. I, I don't know. I'm just even thinking, you know, because I would like to think we'll, we'll, we'll be fine with our recruitment process, but it's, it, it's unpredictable. I'm sorry, I just wanted to. Ways that this is impacting us. Yeah, but I appreciate that, Claudia, and I agree <laughs> all points there. Um, a lot of it is so up in the air right now, so that proactive thinking might be a good planning anyway might be a good thing for us to be considering. Um, you know, we have we're down to it looks like about five minutes right now. Um, I thought I would just uh, maybe we could just quickly. Um, Share how, how are you engaging your, your team and your staff to provide the support and community that, that they need right now? I think that might be a, a point we could close on. Just what are you doing to keep your staff, you know, safe, sane, and healthy and all that good stuff? Um, this is Rivi. We're trying to 
trying to meet at least twice a week and we we've been doing okay so far but i have a very small staff and we tend to all like to be very engaged with each other anyway and our institution is doing a really good job of keeping everybody engaged um before we wrap up i don't know if everybody knows this because i never saw any communication on it um on may 1st it was that was the weekend of the eoa board meeting they are going to be holding virtual roundtables for all the programs i only know because i'm moderating one of the tables so i guess invites are coming out to all of eoa i don't know when but just so everybody knows that i think they're like late friday may 1st i don't know if karen or anybody else has any more information rivi i actually do I have a lot of information. Uh, as I have been the technology person taking over that, so thank you very much. Um, I just this morning have gotten all the information from the roundtable hosts. Um, so there'll be program roundtables on Friday, May 1st. Um, each program has about an hour and a half, and they're scheduled throughout the day with minimal overlap i don't i think the only ones that might overlap are like talent search and mcnair or veterans upper bound and sss which probably it would be pretty rare for a lot of those people to overlap anyway uh but i i will finalize that after this meeting and send it out to madam president who then um, plans to have an email, if not over the weekend, on Monday for sure. So um, the, the meetings are from 9.30 until 3.30, depending on what it is. SSS, I can actually tell you, SSS is scheduled from 10 to 11.30 on Friday. Um, so there, that, is, does that help answer your question, Rivi, or at least round out some of the answer you had. Yes, because I just, as we schedule these, I just wanted everybody to be aware that that opportunity for the round tables is coming up. Mm -hmm. It will be, they're all scheduled via Zoom. Um, and yes, you can expect invitations at least by Monday. Um, but yep, my goal is to have that out to Rebecca before too long here. That's good to know. Thank you for that. Um, any last comments or anything anyone wants to say before we call it a day? I was just going to share that um, just in response to your, your question. I have a slightly larger staff. It's about uh, a total of nine, and we are hiring another person. Um, and so we, we have. Um, like on Fridays, just close out. That's why I, I didn't tune in until 11.30. Um, and so we do different things uh, during that time. So we're trying to like replicate the time we would have had like when we're in the office and we're just kind of gathering informally. And that has been really important um, for us. And I have kind of set the expectation that we all can uh, participate and we we do end up having um, fun in those so I just wanted to share that with you group. thanks Claudia yeah, we just had a like a session with all of our students a, kind of a drop-in session we had like 20 some students show up so it's pretty amazing and it, so the need is definitely out there for them to feel connected to us I think um, so you know, sometimes things are a little busy you kind of forget I, I forget that sometimes, but seeing that really reminded me how important it is for um, our students to be able to, kind of to be there and see how much uh, our students needed us. So that was really a good eye opener for me, um, validation of how important we <clears throat> we are in their in, in their success and more than ever right now. I think. So 
guess that well, it's 12 noon, so I think we'll call it a day. And I, I sure appreciate everybody joining us for these two uh, meetings. And, and we'll have more updates, and I'll send out the a link like I did last time. We'll have the notes and the link to the video as well. So, so thank you all for for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for setting them up. Guys, have a good weekend. Thank you. Everybody have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.